Hello, and thank you for joining this Onc Live Peer Exchange titled Advanced Breast Cancer, a Continuum of Care. As breast cancer research continues to produce positive gains, patients are achieving longer survival through multiple lines of therapy. With this continued progress comes increased complexity in terms of how we choose a course of therapy for the individual patient and how we combine or sequence agents through the continuum of care. In this Onc Live Peer Exchange, my colleagues and I will review the data from the 2016 San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. We'll add a practical perspective on how the new data applies to what we already know about patient care. I am Dr. Adam Brusky, and I am Professor of Medicine and Associate Division Chief for the Division of Hematology Oncology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Participating today on our distinguished panel are Dr. Atidya Bardia, Attending Physician at the Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center and Assistant Professor at the Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Kimberly Blackwell, Professor of Medicine, Assistant Professor in Radiation Oncology, and member of the Duke Cancer Institute in Durham, North Carolina. Finally, Dr. Mark Robeson, attending physician at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, New York. Thank you so much for joining us, and let's begin. So the first thing to really talk about, even though this is a kind of a uh, advanced breast cancer uh, is something that I think is on the minds of a lot of breast cancer oncologists, a lot of general oncologists also that take care of breast cancer. Uh, and that is, how do we use all of these multiparametric genomic tests? I mean, we have the 21 gene assay, we've got the 70 gene assay, we have the PAM50 assay, we have biotheranostics, we now have EPCLIN or what's endopredict. I mean, how is someone going to choose, if at all? And so I'll start with Mark, who I, you know, is an attending physician at a, a major U.S. cancer center. What do you guys do at Memorial? Right. So I think like many people, we have been using the 21 gene recurrence score for quite some time. And as a matter of fact, our workflows are set up so that um, the surgeons are essentially requesting that on everybody who looks like it's appropriate at the time of the surgery. So it, it comes to us as part of our initial oncology consultation. So we've, we've developed all of our workflows and clinical pathways around that information, um, but recognizing that it sometimes doesn't give us the information that we need. And I think most of what we've been focusing on is the, the issue of prediction of chemotherapy benefit. I mean, prognostication is, is certainly useful, but it, it, ultimately when it comes down to conversations with the patients, you want to know are they or are they not going to benefit from incremental therapy. And until we have the results of Taylor X and our expander, we're kind of left in a little bit of a void there. And so the MindAC data is interesting because you know, not only does it give you another prognostic um, perspective, if you will, uh, the thought that it could at least also contribute to some information about the potential benefit of chemo is, is attractive. Um, but whether it's attractive enough, I think, is an uncertain question because of what we were talking about before we began with the issue of the statistical design of the study and sense of how much benefit from chemotherapy is enough to offer it to people. So we're still negotiating through that value proposition. So, Atidya, do you guys, what do you use at uh, uh, Mass General? Yeah, I think um, our preference is also to use the 21 gene um, assay, the Oncotype DX, to make a decision about um, endocrine therapy versus chemotherapy. Um, and an issue that we often run into is when we get the intermediate score, uh, the intermediate recurrence score. And in that perspective, MAMA print um, is, is different that you either get a positive or negative or a low or um, high risk. But some would question that uh, it probably also has a gray zone. Um, in terms of um, Preference of using Oncotype versus Mamaprint in general, our preference is to use Oncotype. And I think that reflects the general practice in the U.S. also. Kim? Yeah, so I don't have much to add other than I think in, in 2017, women facing breast cancer probably should be having their tumor sent for some sort of genomic predictor. And as an oncologist taking care of those women, you should pick one that you know in the ins and outs of, be able to communicate what it means very well. Um, so whatever that assay is, I, I don't think we have a winning assay at this point. I think the most important thing is for the practicing oncologist to really figure out how these assays work, pick one, and make certain that women facing breast cancer are in, somewhat entitled to those results in their decision making about whether or not to receive chemotherapy or not. 
and likewise extended therapy. I'm finding that we have a lot of patients, the longer you're in practice, you have a lot of patients, and we're gonna talk about it, you know, that reach that five-year point and say, do I need to stay on it, do I not? Um, and using these genomic predictors to also guide extended adjuvant endocrine therapy. Right. So I'll give kind of a, a my impression too. As everybody knows, I've been very. What do you, um, what do you think? Yeah, I've been very, very vocal on this topic for many years. Um, I, I think the real issue here is that the one thing, Kim, that you pointed out is very, very true. And you know, we're part of Via Oncology, as you may or may not know. You know, which is a, a pathway group uh, similar to NCCN, but we're a little bit more um, uh, narrow in what we recommend. Uh, and in Via, we literally just decided probably two months ago to allow one of three uh, multiparametric genomic tests. We allow the, the 21 gene assay, which we all know about for many years. In fact, that was the one we used for many years. We now are allowing the 70 gene assay, the mammal print, and PAM50. Um, and the one thing you realize when you do these is you realize they all are gonna do predictive. They're all gonna be predictive. Well, they're all at least prognostic. prognostic. Let's prognostic. Yeah. Um, the real question is that, you know, PAM50 does not have predictive data at all. Um, Mammoprint does, and we could, probably should talk about that a little bit and kind of discuss the design of MindAct for our audience. Um, and uh, the 21 gene, the Oncotype, does have predictive data too, and we're all used to Oncotype because it's been around since 2005. We're used to using it. There were, the initial trials were kind of small, but there's been a huge, you know, as you know, many, many follow-up registry data, you know, you know uh, uh, stuff from Kaiser, you know, 10 to 10,000 people or whatever that used it. Um, but the real interesting thing is, you know, is they all do the same thing, but there are subtleties between the different tests. And the interesting thing is our payers in the Western Pennsylvania area, our major payers, really have gone into the weeds. And they actually look at the, um, the characteristics of the patient before they allow someone to have a test. For example, if you're postmenopausal or you're premenopausal, mm -hmm. you cannot have a PAM50. If you have one to three nodes positive, you can't have an Oncotype DX. So we now actually have payers that are coming to us and they're going, well, listen, you know, we're gonna give you one test. And they only give you one test, you can't do two. So we're really getting into it. And I don't know if there's gonna be sophistication, there probably should, maybe, around the country. But I think this is where we're possibly going because these tests are not cheap, you know, and I think some of the payers are really starting to look at them and ask what they're really doing.